fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. His name is Ray Grant. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. Al, thanks very much for having me. In the July-August 1985 edition of the Mensa Bulletin, there was an article by Gareth Penn, uh, who was another Mensa, who wrote uh, an article called The Calculus of Evil, which was about the Zodiac case. And Gareth's thesis in that article was that the Zodiac killer was uh, committing murders to create um, uh, 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 geometric angles on the uh, landscape. And uh, there's a passage in the Zodiac letter in the uh, uh, July 26, 1970 letter, which is usually called the Mikado letter, or the Little List letter, where there's a postscript where he says, the Mount Diablo code uh, concerns radians and the number of inches along the radians. So the radian is an angle of 57.29 degrees, and if you uh, plot that angle on the San Francisco Bay Area and you uh, the, um, the point of Mount Diablo on the map that was sent, uh, the killer, it's in June of 1970, he had sent a, a uh, Phillips 66 map, which had the, the uh, peak of Mount Diablo circled. If you connected Mount Diablo with the crime scene at Washington and Cherry, where Paul Stein was murdered, and uh, made, an, made a, an angle with that by rotating through the point of Mount Diablo to the murder sites at Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs Park, you had an angle which at least approximated 57.29 degrees. Now, if somebody had just observed that and said, hey, look, it's a radian. Okay, it might not, not have much merit, but since the writer himself said that, and he mentioned radian, and uh, the murder sites appeared to be at least uh, approximately along the um, lines of a radian angle, then uh, it, it seems to me it had uh, some merit. And I began writing, I began uh, having phone conversations with Gareth and uh, writing to him, and we had a fairly extensive correspondence from about, I guess, July or August of 1985 until um, uh, May of 1990. And during the course of that uh, correspondence, correspondence, I began to suspect that Gareth Penn himself might be involved in uh, the Zodiac murders. And uh, Gareth named a specific person who was a at the time was a lecturer at uh, Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, Michael Henry O'Hare. And uh, uh, Michael O'Hare was someone who had multiple degrees from Harvard. He had been born in New York City in 1943. Uh, he generally resembled the Zodiac sketch. Of course, a lot of people do. And uh, he also, his handwriting was very similar to that of uh, the Zodiac Killer, at least these, these samples that I have seen, and I, uh, Gareth featured them in his book, Time 17, which came out in 1987. Uh, people who download my book on Amazon, Zodiac Killer Solved, can see for themselves their, these samples that are, are given there. But the thing that convinced me most about uh, Michael O'Hare is that he had had an article in the of uh, the, the March uh, 1967 issue of Progressive Architecture, where he had created a an artificial uh, angle on a uh, model of the MIT Tower. Uh, and the 
article was about uh, the difficulty of wind patterns in the vestibule of the Earth Sciences Building at MIT, that's Building 54, and it's generally called the MIT Tower. And uh, in the course of creating the illustration for the article, Michael O'Hare had created this artificial angle of 117 degrees. And coincidentally, perhaps, 117 degrees is the longitude of Riverside, California, where the first Zodiac murder took place. So those were that was generally the basis for the suspicion of Michael O'Hare as the Zodiac killer. Um, as I said, I, I began to suspect Gareth of complicity in the Zodiac crime just based on things that he said in his own letters. I talk about that, those in my book. The first 12 chapters of my book are actually about the conventional evidence in the case, where I analyze the forensics, the ballistics, the uh, uh, circumstantial evidence, and also the um, eyewitness testimony in the case. And um, it's essentially, if you look at the conventional evidence in the case, I believe you will come to the conclusion that the first three victims, Cherry Bates, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were all uh, were abducted prior to their murders, and uh, there's there's a general pattern in the conventional evidence which leads one to believe that the Zodiac killer was actually multiple people. That uh, I believe four people were involved in the murders. Uh, Michael O'Hare, who as I said was a lecturer at Harvard, is currently a, a lecturer in public policy at Cal Berkeley. Uh, Gareth Penn, who is a retired uh, librarian who currently lives in the Seattle area. The other two people were Berta Margulies, who was the mother of Mar uh, Michael O'Hare. She was born in 1907. She died in 1996. And the fourth conspirator was Gareth's father, who was a statistician for the California Highway Patrol and also for the California Department of Justice in Sacramento. He was born in 1913. He died in um, 1995. So essentially what my book says is that four people were involved in the murders, that the murders were planned and orchestrated, and that the evidence backs all of that up. Can I ask here, now, um, what was Garth Penn's um, relationship with O'Hara? That's, you know, I uh, you had Michael, Michael Butterfield on your show a couple of uh, weeks ago, and, and one of the things that uh, Michael Butterfield has, has criticized about my own work is that I don't tell you um, what the basis was for the, the, whatever you want to call it, the conspiracy in this case. And the problem with my explaining that is I have no idea. You know, it's, it's, right. it's like I, I can tell you these four people were involved based on what I know and what uh, they have said and their their own actions. I have, you know, um, I have uh, confronted, I confronted Michael O'Hare at Harvard. I sent copies of my, in 1990, I wrote a book called The Zodiac Murder Solved. And I printed out 96 copies. I sent six copies to the Harvard administration. I sent the other 90 copies to the faculty at the John F. Kennedy School. And I, this would have been, this would have been in November 1990. And I said, Michael O'Hare is the Zodiac killer. If he is innocent of the Zodiac crimes, he has two choices. He can either sue me, um, and, uh, you know, and take me to court and, and so forth. The, the problem with doing that is if he sues me, I have the right to ask for his fingerprints and to ask that they be compared with the Zodiac prints that were left at crime scenes in California. Uh, the other, but, uh, people are constantly telling me that if you sue somebody, you're kind of, you're acknowledging them and you're, you're acting as though they're, accusation has merit. Well, first of all, Michael O'Hare didn't have to sue me to prove that he wasn't the Zodiac. He had already talked to, by his own admission, had talked to the FBI uh, in Massachusetts a couple of times pertaining to the 
Zodiac case because he was initially accused by Gareth Penn. And all he had to do was call up the FBI and say, I've been accused by multiple people now of being the Zodiac killer. I would like to submit my fingerprints for comparison with the prints on file at the FBI lab. And if he's innocent, that should be end, uh, you know, the discussion there. But Michael O'Hare chose not to do that. When I made my accusation, his immediate response was to quit his job at Harvard, sell his house, move his wife who worked for the state of Massachusetts, move his two daughters who, uh, you know, who then had to leave their friends uh, in the neighborhood. And also, uh, keep in mind, I was also accusing his mother of the Zodiac crimes. Right. His mother, Berta Margolis, lived in his house on in Brookline on Abbots, Abbotsford Road, and she then had to relocate to uh, Walnut Acres, California, and Michael O'Hare ended up moving to Berkeley, California. If someone accused me of uh, serial murder, I think my first response would be to say, I'm innocent, take whatever you want. If you want my fingerprints, my DNA, what have you. Uh, how much more motivated would I be to confront my accuser if that person had accused my mother of the same thing? But Michael O'Hare didn't do any of that. He simply absconded to the other end of the country, and that was that. And you might ask, well, what did Harvard do about this? Harvard, there was no upside for Harvard to react one way or the other, because if they had a notorious serial killer who was not only a graduate of the school, but who was a member of the faculty of the school, how does it how does it benefit Harvard to admit that or to try to publicize that? So they just they essentially kept quiet about the whole thing, and I was left basically with, what do I do now? I've accused, I've accused the person I think who is the Zodiac killer, and he is all he's done is just moved to the other end of the country. Did he contact you personally? No. Michael O'Hare has uh, commented on me in emails which have been forwarded to me. Uh, I don't think I can do anything. Uh, with the, here's one of the interesting aspects. People like Mike Butterfield, for example, are constantly citing a an article that Michael O'Hare wrote for the Washington Monthly back in I believe it's in the May-June edition of 2009 of the Washington Monthly. Uh, the name of that article is called Confessions of a, Confessions of a Non-Serial Killer. And um, I don't have the title in front of me. I think that's the title. Um, and essentially he's talking about um, his, his interaction with Gareth Penn. Now, you have to remember that Michael O'Hare was the trigger man in the Zodiac case, and the function of Gareth Penn was to be his PR agent. In other words, they had created this interesting puzzle for the world to contemplate, and the idea was that after 10 years or so, Gareth Penn would come forward, as he did in 1980, and begin to point out, you know, look, there's this radiant art, uh, angle that the killer created, and he mentions Radiance in his letters. And there's this man, you know, Michael O'Hare, who seems, who looks like the killer, writes just like the killer, and seems to, you know, have many of the attributes that, that the killer would have. Okay, so um, in his article in the Washington Monthly, all Michael O'Hare talks about is Gareth Penn. He doesn't mention me once. And, he, and remember, I'm the person who turned his life upside down. I'm the person who accused him in front of all of his colleagues, and then his reaction to that was simply to quit his dream. What he admitted was his dream job. If you read the Harvard class reports from 1989, there are a couple of paragraphs in there where Michael O'Hare uh, talked about uh, that he's a he's a, a public policy professional. He even has a he's on a website now that's called the reality-based community and the um, the uh, the online address for that is samefacts.com where he talks about the the ideal place to be if you're a public policy professional is the, is the JFK school at Harvard and yet when he was accused of being the zodiac killer by 
Ray Grant, who is, you know, I'm a, I'm currently a uh, civil service retiree. I worked for the uh, U.S. Postal Service for 37 years, so I'm not exactly, you know, the most intimidating person that he, that he would need to confront, and yet his reaction to all of that was simply to walk away from what had been his entire life from the time when he was an undergraduate in 1960 until when I made the accusation in November of 1990. Why would anyone do that? Why would you walk away from your from the ultimate job that you that you your what you yourself admit is your dream job, when the only time that the only um, uh, occupation that Michael O'Hare had in his entire adult life was in Greater Boston. He had Michael O'Hare had been a student at Harvard. He was an undergraduate there. After that, he was a an associate professor at MIT from. 1971 until 1979. He worked for the state of Massachusetts from 79 through 81. And then from 81 until I accused him in 1990, he was a lecturer in public policy at the, the JFK school. Why would you walk away from that? The only time when he wasn't in greater Boston, oddly enough, was when he was, uh, he was employed by Arthur D. Little in San Francisco during the Zodiac period. Okay, so, uh, and again, when you, you know, you mentioned, uh, when you and I talked earlier, you mentioned the fact that I have many critics on the various Zodiac killer websites. That's true, but the, the question I ask is, why would any sane person uh, allow somebody to intimidate him that way, you know, to allow his entire life to be turned upside down and then, again, the upshot of that is when he writes his Washington Monthly article in 2009, he doesn't even mention me. He mentions Gareth Penn, who's a co-conspirator, because he knows Gareth Penn isn't going to sue him. So probably the greatest irony, at least in terms of what my book reveals, is the fact that I have no worries about Michael. I can accuse him of being the Zodiac killer until I'm blue in the face. It's, he is never going to sue me. What Michael O'Hare has to worry about is my suing him. Because if he ever comes out and says anything along the lines of Ray Grant is a liar, Ray Grant is kind of saying things about me that aren't true, then I can take him to court. And if I take him to court, I will get his fingerprints. And uh, as I said, as I believe, he, his fingerprints will match what was left in uh, Northern California during the Zodiac period, and he'll be arrested. Now, now coming from a, um, an amateur at this, uh, but into the serial killer realm a lot, uh, I have to ask now, so if Michael O'Hare and his three, um, how do you say, um, partners? Zodiac. Yeah, Zodiac and his partners um, were doing this. Um, how do they get involved into killing um, because when you're actually killing people, um, isn't there some sort of psychological need to do that? Like, why would you just stop then and decide, okay, well, that's enough? Like, how could, uh, I'm just asking from a point of view as an amateur, so many serial killers will kill until they get killed or, or pr imprison themselves. Uh, so th that's kind of a big step. Well, when I, keep in mind, Gareth Penn and I, uh, kept up a correspondence for four or five years. We also talked on the phone uh, many times between 1985 and 1990. And I once asked Gareth, I said, how could somebody with Michael O'Hare's background actually kill people? Okay, because killing people is a tremendous dividing line between us and these, you know, these people that were fascinated with the Ted Bundys and the Dennis Raiders and so forth. And we look at them and we say, well, you know, I could never do anything like that because at the point of, you know, I mean, certainly I think each one of us at one point or another has wanted to kill somebody for various reasons, you know. But uh, we don't do it because at, at that point we decide, you know, I do not want an end, to end another person's life. And when I asked Gareth Penn about this, I said, why would someone with Michael O'Hare's background and who had spent all this time, you know, in academic, you know, taking graduate courses and writing articles for progressive architecture and other 
um, you know, very uh, esoteric um, magazines. And, uh, you know, being obviously an extremely bright person, why would he do something like this? And Garrett's response was that uh, that he was cold-blooded. And again, he said, you have to remember, he's not committing murders for the conventional reason. If I'm Ted Bundy committed murders because he had uh, a need, he had a psych, whatever you want to call it, a psychosexual need uh, to murder women. And, uh, you know, to an extent, you would have to say that he couldn't stop himself. And the same thing with uh, Dennis Rader. But in the case of the Zodiac Killers, they weren't doing that, um, you know, because of any psychological need they had. They were doing it because they wanted to create this, whatever you want to call it, this puzzle, this, um, you know, this, uh, I've, I've had it, uh, I've had my work derisively described. I've had people say, well, do you think the Zodiac murders were an art project? Well, they weren't only an art project. Part of the idea was was to create a prototypical serial killer who was, you know, who was doing the things that fascinated me about Son of Sam, where, uh, you know, not only was he killing people apparently compulsively, but he was writing to the police about it, as, uh, as Dennis Rader also did. And just the idea of that, you know, I, as I said, I, I found very fascinating. So the Zodiac killers were, were constantly doing that. They were, they were creating this kind of um, uh, pattern, whatever you want to call it. And it, it, it involved um, the, uh, you know, the time. And, and the other thing you have to remember is that the Zodiac, killer, the Zodiac murders were designed to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. As I mentioned in my book, the entire Zodiac project was intended to come to an end on Friday, August the 11th, 1989, at specific places in Greater Boston. And in the uh, that's an event that I call in my book the Terminus event. It's the same thing I talk about in in my book in 1990. And um, so the you know as I as I told Gareth, I said I can't believe anyone would go to this much trouble. Uh, and then, you know, not intend to go out with a big bang. And that, that is exactly what they intended to do. Um, so it was, it was more a matter of their motivation was to create a kind of, uh, puzzle. Like, okay? you know, this, this, for the, for the same reason that you read, um, that, that you go and you watch a movie. If you've ever seen the movie Seven by David Fincher, right. where the guy is, the guy is actually creating this kind of like pattern, which is based upon these seven seven deadly sins or whatever they are, um, and it's this, it's basically the same idea. They were making a presentation, and you can see that. For example, I'll, I'll give you a, just one quick example of that. The number of times that the killer struck in his public murders was uh, was was planned out ahead of time. The Zodiac Killer uh, fired 10 shots at Lake Herman Road. He fired nine shots at Blue Rock Springs Park. He stabbed a couple at Lake Barry F. He stabbed the man seven times and the woman 10 times. So he, he inflicted 17 stab wounds. And then at uh, Presidio Heights, he shot Paul Stein once on the right side of his head. So in other words, he fired 20 shots and he inflicted 17 stab wounds. If you remember the scorecard at the bottom of the uh, exorcist letter in January of uh, 1974, it says me 37 SFPD zero, zero. And the 37 is simply the number of times that he struck. He fired 10, uh, 10 shots at Lake, Lake Herman Road, nine shots at Blue Rock Springs Park, and one in Presidio Heights. That's 20 shots. And he, he inflicted 17 stab wounds at Lake Berryessa. So 20 plus 17 equals 37. So when he says me 37 at the PD zero, uh, people think he's claiming 37 victims. He isn't. He's saying I have struck 37 times and SFPD hasn't laid a glove on me. So it's, it's producing that sort of, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's a kind of puzzle construction. In, but what's unusual about it is that normally when you see that kind of 
whatever you want to call it, that kind of villain uh, in the in the movies doing something like that, it's fictional. In this case, it was actually done in real life. How did, how did Michael O'Hare choose the other three people that he was working with? Again, I have my the only uh, I ha I have no idea what the psychological dynamics were of the four people. We know that what you basically have is you have the trigger man who is Michael O'Hare, you have the PR man who is Gareth Penn, and the other two people were Michael's mother, um, Berta Margulies, and Gareth's father who is Hugh Penn, and. I, if you're asking me what was their interaction like, I have no idea. If, if uh, I can tell you what their, what each each one's contribution was. Michael O'Hare, for example, was a member of a rifle team at Harvard in 1960. So one assumes that he was good with firearms. Uh, Berta Margulies was a member of the. She was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first. Secretary of the Sculptors Guild in New York City. And if you're familiar with the art world back in the early, late 1950s, early 1960s, the type of event that the Zodiac, um, the Zodiac Project presents is exactly the sort of thing that you saw in the art world. You would see these things that were called uh, happenings, where artists would create these events, sometimes they were kind of random, and sometimes they had a kind of, you know, very specific point. Um, and uh, I remember, for example, there was a, there was a, one artist set up a cocktail party where the centerpiece for the party was a Volkswagen Beetle that he was crucified to, where the, the artist himself had his uh, hands and feet nailed to the a chassis of a VW Beetle, and what was supposed to happen was a kind of cocktail party around that. Now, that's you know that that sounds a little far out there, but you know, but that's essentially what the art world was dealing with. If you're if you're familiar with things like the photographs of Robert Mapplethorpe, and you know some of the the uh, I'll get a more recent example, if you're familiar with um, Christo's Gates in Central Park. Right. Uh, essentially, the event itself only exists for a very short time. I think the Gates in Central Park only lasted for 16 days, and um, he spent, I think, uh, 35 years in the pre-production mode for that thing that was only going to last for a very short time. But that's the idea. It, it's a kind of it's a kind of artistic construction involving like large spaces and that's basically what the zodiac case was it was the creation of these things that were in the san francisco bay area with the radiant angle in the um in riverside it was a specific point in boston uh the the formation that they were about to create was not completed because i intervened in 1989 to prevent it from you know from the determined event from happening but that was the triangle uh, that was uh, made up of the uh, burial place of Joan Webster and uh, and two buildings in um, in Greater Boston. One was the Liberty Mutual Building of 175 Berkeley, and the other was the MIT Tower. And both of those appear in uh, literature of uh, Michael O'Hare. The um, the 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 MIT Tower was featured uh, in his for in his Maiden Journal article. So uh, U Penn, as I said, was a statistician for the California Department of Justice. So his contribution, and he was also a cryptographer during World War II. He worked for the Army Air Corps. So his contribution apparently was the cryptography which was sent with some of the zodiac letters, and also his knowledge of uh, you know police patterns. For example, if you look at the Zodiac crimes, you will note that uh, most of them, many of them took place right around the time when there were shift changes uh, in the local police departments. And that, that would be the time when it was, uh, when a person would be uh, least likely to be happened upon by a patrol unit because when there's a shift change, the patrol units all go back to the, you know, headquarters 
So each of the conspirators, uh, you know, contributed to, you know, to the overall project in his own way. How, how did they choose their actual victims? Because I know that's sort of how you um, presented in your <clears throat> book. Yes, if you look the the um, the zodiac sent a letter in October of twenty uh, um, in uh, July twenty sixth, nineteen seventy. He he sent what is called the Mikado letter or the little list letter, and he said, "I have a little list." And the first question you might ask is, uh, where how would a person construct a list of people to uh, to be potential victims? Well, if you're you pen and you're a statistician for the California Highway Patrol and for the Department of Justice, you have access to the state driver database. And one of the things we note is that all of the Zodiac crimes were um, in proximity to a vehicle. For example, um, when Cherry Bates was murdered, her, her car was parked about a block to the west of the murder site, and she was last... Uh, you know, seeing driving her car. Same thing with uh, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. They were found uh, at uh, David Faraday's uh, Rambler, uh, his Rambler station wagon. Same thing. Darlene Farron was shot in her car. The when the two victims were stabbed at Lake Berryessa, the Zodiac then walked up to the highway where their car was parked, and. Uh, uh, wrote a note in felt-tip pen on the passenger side door of the car, and uh, you know Paul Stein was shot inside his taxi cab. So, if you one of the things that uh, you know you can locate a victim by tying him to his vehicle. If you if I have access to the state driver database, that means that I can I know you know I know where the person lives. Uh, if I have access to the driver's license or to the vehicle registration, I know what kind of car he drives. So, for example, if I wanted to locate Al Warren and I had the, you know, the the, uh, the state driver's base in Arizona, the database, all I would have to do is enter your name in there, and it would tell me where your what your address was, and I could probably get information about what sort of vehicle you drove. And then you could locate the person just by locating where his car is. If you go to his house and you see his car there, he's probably there. So that's part of it. If you look at, there are connections between the victims in the Zodiac keys. Here's an example. The two victims at, um, at uh, Lake Berryessa, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, were both Seventh-day Adventists. The medical examiner at uh, Riverside, uh, Renee Boglin, the one who autopsied Cherry Bates, was also a Seventh-day Adventist. And here's the odd thing. Both Cherry Joe Bates and her father, Joseph Bates, had a name which contained the name of the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, who was Joseph Bates. So you have Cherry Josephine Bates, who was murdered, and you have Joseph Bates, who received uh, one of the three loose leaf letters in, in April of 1967. Now, was the Zodiac Killer being cruel by sending that letter? He, what he was actually doing was pointing out that the name Joseph Bates was significant, and uh, it was contained within her name. Now, I point out in my book, in the cryptography session, and we're getting a little bit away here a little bit away from the conventional evidence. The, the first 12 chapters of my book are strictly about the conventional uh, evidence in, in the case, but if you look, for example, at the names of the two victims in uh, Vallejo, uh, David Faraday and Darlene Farron, both those names contain, by redivided Morse code, the word Easter, okay? And I mentioned the significance of that uh, in my book. So there is, there, there is, uh, uh, there is significant reason to believe that he was picking the victims because of their names, because of properties that their names had. And here's another example. If you look at the Zodiac Killer himself, uh, he talks about um, the radiant angle in the uh, 
the July 26, 1970 letter, a radian is a circle divided by 2 pi, okay? If you take the first, the whole number in first seven digits of the uh, fraction of pi, it's 3.1415926. If you then apply alphabet um, uh, letters to those numbers, what you get is 3 is C, 1 is A, 4 is D, 15 is O, 9 is I, and 26 is B. That's an anagram for zodiac. So there is reason to believe that the killer did not pick the name Zodiac because it refers to astrology or to astronomy. He picked that name because it's a reference to the, um, the uh, you know, the constant pi, okay? So there's, re as I said, there's reason to believe if you look at the names of the victims and uh, his overall um, methodology, that that's how he, he was picking his victims. He, he, his victims were chosen because of qualities that their that their names had. And uh, then, I what I suspect happened is that he had multiple potential victims uh, in each venue, and then he simply chose they simply chose the victims who were most uh, either mo the ones who were most uh, uh, appropriate are the ones who were available at the time that they wanted to commit the murders. Is there a reason why they actually stopped? Well, they didn't stop. Um, if you re again, if you read my book, um, the uh, most I, I would guess about fifty percent of the people who follow the case believe that the Riverside murder was a Zodiac murder. So. Uh, Generally speaking, if you follow the case, you either believe there were five murders or six murders. The the uh, there were two people killed at Lake Berryessa. There was one person killed at uh, Blue Rock Springs Park, one person at Lake Berryessa, and one person at Presidio Heights. So, uh, if you go by the four canonical uh, events, then there were five victims. If you add the Riverside uh, murder to that, there were six. If you read my book, I say there were 11 victims. I believe that, for example, um, uh, Shelley Hombo, who was a, uh, an infant, actually a toddler in Los Gatos, uh, was abducted and then murdered October 19, 1969. I believe that's a Zodiac murder. I believe the Robert Salem uh, murder in San Francisco on Stevenson Street which occurred in in uh, my term in my timeline. It occurred March 29, 1970. I believe that's a zodiac murder. I believe the abduction of Donna Lass from Lake Tahoe from the Sahara Hotel that was September 6, 1970. I believe that's a zodiac murder, and I believe uh, the abduction and murder of Joan Webster in Boston, which occurred November 28, 1981 was uh, the last Zodiac murder. I also add a, with a person who I could say is a collateral victim, James Scarlett, who died in a fire in Riverside in, on June 18th, 1981, which I say was set by the Zodiac. Um, so I believe there were 11 victims. And as I said, the, there was never any, the, the intent was that the entire Zodiac project was going to come to an end on August the 11th, 1989. Um, I then, um, you know, in, in 1981, I caused pol um, actually security forces to be put in the two places where I believe, which I believe were the target zones. And, uh, you know, so those events didn't take place. So really the only reason this thing is unsolved is that, uh, uh, if you're going by my book, that I prevented the Terminus event from taking place, and as a result of that, uh, the Zodiac murders didn't come to an end. If you take Ray Grant out of the equation, then the Zodiac murders wouldn't have been unsolved. They would have been solved back in 1989. And so now are you going to – do you think this will actually become solved ever, or is this just kind of going to yes. be – you do. I do. Well, yes, there's no question. Um, there are 
first of all, as I said, Bertha Margulies died in 1996. Hugh Penn died in 1995. Michael O'Hare is currently 73 years old. He's a uh, he's still a professor in public policy at Cal Berkeley. His dad was born in his dad Eugene Robert O'Hare was born in 1906 and he died in 1982. So he died when he I don't know what his specific um, uh, dates are, but uh, he died either at 75 or 76. So if Michael O'Hare is 73 now. You figure he's got maybe, you know, maybe 10 years to go or less than that, okay? And Gareth Penn's dad I, died in 1995 when he was in his early 80s, and Gareth is currently 75. So I, I tend to believe it's entirely possible that this, that the case will come to uh, fruition uh, sometime in the next 10 years or so. I do not expect it to turn into a Jack the Ripper. Um, now, what what exactly is going to happen? Whether material, you know, for example, will Cherry Bates' driver's license and um, uh, you know the keys from uh, Paul Stein's, um, you know, a, a Paul Stein's wallet, the keys to his taxi. Uh, uh, one of the things that uh, cab drivers in San Francisco back in the '60s used to have was a was a cab driver's badge which would have been in Paul Stein's wallet. So if he's put the, all of those things in a, you know, in a, uh, uh, you know, a, a safe deposit box somewhere, uh, presumably they would come to a light. I find it very interesting that Gareth Penn lived his entire life in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then he chose, now his son is a chef in the Seattle area, he chose to move to the Seattle area uh, back in 2002, and the Seattle area is not very far from the Canadian border. So if one of the remaining conspirators died, particularly if it were Michael O'Hare, um, you know, Gareth Penn could just get into his car and drive across the border, and it would be relatively difficult without, like, direct evidence to get uh, Canada to, to extradite him. It is... It is, it's not hard at all to get someone extradited if they're being accused of a capital crime. It is much more difficult to extradite someone who is simply a person of interest in a crime. So what, what is it about this case, Zodiac, that has people so fascinated and, and, and brings them to comparison of like Jack the Ripper? Well... The here's the ironic thing about the Zodiac case, which is if you read websites, if you we mentioned uh, earlier, we talked about uh, Mike Morford's website, ZodiacKillerSite.com. We talked about uh, Mike Butterfield's site, which is ZodiacKillerFacts.com. I would be remiss if I did not mention Tom Voigt's site, ZodiacKiller.com, although Tom and I are no, are no longer uh, friendly. And uh, you also have a, a very good site, and in my opinion, it's Richard Grinnell's site, ZodiacCiphers.com. Uh, but all of these sites essentially deal with aspects of the crime which are not evidentiary, and that's the real problem. If, if um, you know, I, I I don't know how to adequately bring this across. The all of these people who are posting on message boards and talking on, you know, filing articles on websites are really not dealing with the evidence in the case. If you look at the evidence in the case, none of the individual crimes uh, make any sense in terms of if you if you honestly believe the Zodiac Killer was a single person, the evidence says you're wrong, okay? Uh, if you look, for example, at, um, at the Riverside murder, uh, Cherry Bates was, uh, you know, she disappeared circa 6.15 p.m. the night she was murdered. Riverside PD, two weeks after the murder, on Sunday, November 13, 1966, did a real-time reconstruction in the Riverside City College Library. It involved 65 people. Um, the attendees were who had been in the library the night of the murder the attendees were instructed to park in the same space as they parked the night that they were of the murder. They were instructed to sit in the same uh, seat inside the library. 
They were instructed to wear the same clothes that they wore that night, and they were told to go through the same motions. In other words, Riverside PD set up a reenactment which went from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. that night where everybody did exactly what they did and wore the same clothes and everything that they had done two weeks earlier. Why would a police department do that? It's because they had no idea where Cherry Bates was after 6.15 p.m. that night. There were there was a witness who saw her driving toward the library at 6.10 p.m. There was a uh, March Air Force Base man who saw her driving up an alley um, uh, about a block from the library at 6.15 p.m., and she was never seen after that, and she was never heard from. She didn't, know, she didn't call anybody on the phone. She didn't leave any messages for anybody. She essentially disappeared from sight at 6.15 uh, p.m., and she was not seen again until the janitor at the library, uh, you know, looked down the alley 45 yards west of the library entrance the next morning and saw her body there. So the question is, where was she? And if you if you have 65 witnesses at the library, several of whom were friends of hers, and they didn't see her, and you have to keep in mind the library was uh, about 2,400 square feet. It was about the size. My house is 2,100 square feet. So if you can imagine 65 people inside your house and this very beautiful and outgoing blonde was there for two hours and 40 minutes and yet nobody saw her, it just, just doesn't make any sense. So the the problem is that, uh, you know, these people who are posting on message boards assume that she was in the RCC library and it's clear from the police reenactment that she wasn't. You also look at the at uh, Cherry Bates' car, she left the doors unlocked, she left the windows down, she left uh, books and her notepad on the front seat, and the ignition, the ignition key was still in the, you know, was still, the key was still in the ignition. Uh, I think, I've had, uh, I've owned cars since 1974, I don't think I've ever walked away from my car with the key still in the ignition. But we are supposed to believe that Cherry Bates voluntarily walked away from the car that night. So what you see is that people people make an assumption that Cherry Bates was inside the library for, for three hours, and the evidence says she wasn't. And the condition her car was left in says she wasn't. And uh, if you look at her autopsy, Cherry Bates finished eating supper that night at 4.45 p.m., and she wasn't murdered until 10.30 p.m. If you know anything about uh, normal, uh, you know, gastric processes, normally a person will finish uh, digesting his food, at least as far as the stomach contents go, in two to four hours. And yet almost six hours after Cherry Bates um, finished eating uh, supper at 4.45 p.m., she still had 3.4 ounces of the supper she ate, which was, roast beef and vegetables in her stomach. That is consistent with a person who is under uh, high stress, someone who thinks she's about to be murdered. If Cherry Bates was abducted circa 6.20 p.m. the night she was murdered, that means that she was in a high stress um, uh, condition for a period of about four hours. She would have been abducted, let's say, circa 6.20 p.m., and she wasn't murdered until 10.30 p.m., okay? And that would explain the food that was left in her stomach. The other odd thing about her murder is if you look at her autopsy, all of the significant damage done to her body was done in one place. It was all done to her uh, throat. There were seven deep slashes in her throat, which transected her uh, carotid artery, her um, carotid artery, arteries and her uh, jugular vein. Um, and there was just, uh, there was, just uh, minor collateral damage to the rest of her body. That is consistent. I just saw a forensic files uh, episode recently where the expert said, anytime you see a stabbing victim and all the uh, stab wounds are in the same place, that means that the victim was held down at some point because normally if somebody is stabbing you, you're going to, to do everything you possibly can to get away. So Cherry Bates was stabbed at least seven times deeply in her throat, and she almost had her her head chopped off. And yet, 
people on Zodiac message boards believe that she was attacked by a man in a pitch dark alley and somehow he was able to hit her multiple times in her throat without producing any sort of, you know, significant wounds on the rest of her body. That could only be the wound pattern you see in her autopsy could only have been produced if Cherry Bates had been attacked by multiple people. If she had been, let's say, wrestled to the ground by a couple of men with one man holding, let's say, pinning her arms to her side and then uh, having her throat slashed from behind by a second man. That's the only thing that makes sense. Uh, you know, somebody engaging in a formal attack with a knife and somehow hitting her every single time uh, in the throat and just producing uh, scratches in the rest of her body don't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. So uh, you have that. You, go ahead. I was just going to say, so what did they do with her for the four hours before they killed her? I'm assuming they just held her. I mean, the, the idea was, both in the case of, you know, I, I talked about how these murders were intended to be um, to create uh, geometric designs on the landscape. So the idea was to place Cherry Bates in a specific point in Riverside, and that's what they did. So they abducted her circa 6.20 p.m. and then held her somewhere. And in the meantime, you have, um, when they did the reenactment at uh, the RCC library, uh, there were two people who went missing. There was a man who fits the, essentially fits the description of Michael O'Hare, who was there, a young man in his 20s with a beard, and uh, a woman who I assume was uh, Berta Marguli. And the very fact that you had two people walking into the library tells you that they were more worried about going into the library with Cherry's student ID so that they could uh, take uh, take books out on her her ID and, and thereby place her in the library. They were more worried about that than they were about uh, what was happening with the victim, which means that clearly there would there had to have been a third abductor who was holding Cherry at bay, perhaps at gunpoint. Uh, the interesting thing is when you look at her op autopsy, there is no evidence of Cherry having been bound at any point. So that's consistent with the fact that Two people went into the library with her student ID, uh, took out the three books that were found inside her car, and that was done simply to place her in the library. The problem is that if you make the assumption that Cherry Bates was in the library, nothing makes sense. She wasn't seen by anybody. She is supposed to have had car trouble because the uh, killer pulled the middle wire of her distributor out, and yet no one saw her. You have a you have the instant you have the very odd configuration of having a very beautiful and outgoing blonde on a street which was um, a block west of the library entrance <laughs> on Terracina Drive, and she had car trouble for an hour and a half, and yet nobody saw her. And um, uh, you, you know the, the it's it I, I don't know it's it's just the, it's. She, Cherry Bates had no reason to walk down a dark alley with anybody. There would have been public phones by the entrance to the RCC library if she did have car trouble. All she had to do was walk over there, call her dad, call one of her friends. And, um, you know, there, uh, her friends have said that she was terrified of the dark. And yet, again, if you believe what's written on Zodiac message boards, she just walked down a very a pitch dark alley with someone who had previously creeped her out, you know, in high school and uh, allowed herself to be murdered. Um, the odd thing about the Zodiac case is that you have victims who apparently were um, cooperating in their own murders. Cherry Bates, for, for no apparent reason, um, you know, uh, went with somebody that she, where she had, she had no reason to go with and the other odd thing about it is if you read the confession letter, which was sent by the killer a month after the murder, uh, one of the sections of the confession letter says, when we were away from the library walking. Well, Cherry Bates' car was 120 yards west of the RCC library entrance. 
but she was murdered 45 yards west of the or in an alley 45 yards west of the entrance which means that if she went walking with her killer, she walked back toward the library. She didn't walk away from the library. And the first question Cherry Bates, who, was very, who according to her friends, was very suspicious about uh, males, she had just become uh, engaged to her fiancé the previous weekend, and uh, she, she, you know, she was very suspicious about people, males coming up to her and, and what their intentions were. Um, Here's a guy who, well, you know, walks up to her at the car and says, let me help you. And then when they can't start the car, he says, okay, well, let's go to my car. And he starts walking back toward the library. First question she would have asked is, what were you doing here a block west of the library if your car is back where the library was, you know? So, I mean, the what makes the Zodiac case different from just about any other famous serial murder cases, if you look carefully at the conventional evidence, the conventional reconstructions of the murders don't make any sense. They only make sense if you assume that the victims, particularly at the rivers, well, the first three victims, the Riverside victim and the victims of Lake Herman Road, were abducted before their murders. The book is Zodiac Killer Solved. It's available on Amazon. There's also a book called Zodiac Killer for Dummies, which is just a streamlined version of Zodiac Killer Solved. And um, I have a, a message board, which is called ZodiacKillerTalk.com. It's actually it's a website in the form of a message board. It looks a little bit like Mike Morford's board, but I just have it up there to comment on various articles on the other websites. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for doing the show. Okay, thanks very much.